We know from chapter 3 that Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray that day, and we also know that they, um, along the way, they uh, saw the man that was lame from birth, and uh, he was healed. Uh, Peter told him to, in the name of Jesus, to rise up and walk, and that's exactly what happened. And of course, all the people saw, and in uh, pe- uh, excuse me, verse nine, it says all the people saw him walking and praising God, and so it was, you know, it was a big deal. This was a huge deal, and so it grew a crowd because this man, they had known him from birth, and he was lame, and now all of a sudden he's praising God. So it was a huge thing. But you know what? Peter uses this opportunity to uh, begin preaching a powerful message that proclaimed Jesus as Messiah. And as he was doing that, Peter got, you know, Peter was a man that told it like it, like it is kind of guy. And he starts blasting them. If you look in verse 15, it says, You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So Peter doesn't hold anything back. He blasts them right out of the water. And then he tells them, okay, you, you know, this has happened. You, you murdered the author of life, but what can we do about it now? He tells them, he tells them in verse 19, he says, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. So he's telling them that what they can do about it now is to repent and turn away from their sin and come to know Jesus, the author of life. Peter wasn't concerned about rejection. He did hear his status. Um, he had no thought of what, what might happen to him at that point. And we see that that ki- type of co- confrontation is the type that transforms. Now, some of us don't, you know, we avoid confrontation at all costs. Others don't, you know, they deal in confrontation a little easier. Uh, but this is the type of confrontation that's born of the Spirit. Uh, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking from a point of strength and power in Christ Jesus. So that brings us to our text today, and as he's talking to the men and women that are gathered there, and we also want to pay attention to where they're gathered, and if you look back at chapter 3, uh, verse 11, it tells us that you know they had gone up to the temple, but they're out there in the portico called Solomon's. So it's the temple area, and we don't want to forget that. So we, we're going to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 4. As they, were beginning, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, you want to take a look at that phrase that they came upon them, because it, that in the original language, that actually means that they came upon them with great anxiety and anger, um, just from the, the tense and the voice of the Greek word. It means they literally grabbed, grabbed them. So it's a violent act done, in, uh, done with malice in their hearts. And now we want to take a look and see who exactly is involved in this scene. Is it crooks? Is it robbers? Is it the type of person that you would think would be uh, intent on doing evil? No, it's the priests. It's the ones who were supposed to represent God. So in the middle of all this crowd, here comes the, you know, the religious community, and they're getting ready to protect their territory. Now, in our world, every day, somewhere, unless you have your, your head in the sand, you know this to be true, There are beheadings, there is crucifixion going on, there's rape and torture, and those are very, very vivid marks of persecution. And we have to ask ourselves, um, how would you and I respond if we were threatened like that? Indeed, how would we respond if, uh, if we were under restriction and persecution? Uh, and we need to be answering those questions because p- persecution may 
be upon us in our lifetime. Now, Sue gave an example in our lesson this week about a boy that, whose mother, I think it was at the end of day two, about a, a mother who had put some scriptures in the, guy, in the little boy's lunch. And when he got to school, you know, the, all the other children were kind of curious, and he began sharing those with, with his friends. And the mother got in trouble for doing that. And I have another example. Um, you know, in August, in August, you remember that uh, the state of Louisiana was under siege once again with uh, underwater. And I came across this story at, at that time, and I actually, I don't know why, but I printed it out. And so I want to just share. It. This law enforcement officer says he was asked to leave a Red Cross shelter in Lafayette, Louisiana, after he prayed with several flood victims. And he he tells the interviewer, he said, I was not proselytizing, he told me. I was just there to thank volunteers and offer prayers and encouragement. Um, he was dressed in uniform, and he was holding a Bible. Um, at some point during the visit, the volunteer approached him and mentioned that there was a problem. And he said, the Red Cross had an issue with me being there. So I asked him what the problem was. He looked down at my Bible, and he gestured and said, they have a problem with that. Meanwhile, a pastor in the town of Albany told me that four families left a Red Cross shelter after they were told they could not pray or read their Bibles at their cots. Okay? Because what they want to do is they want to accommodate all faiths while not offending anyone. And, our, and the point is that this, this officer wound up going outside the shelter and praying with people that needed prayer. But, uh, you know, we need to be aware that this is happening all around us. Um, and those are, um, those are examples of persecution that are going on. But it's not, persecution isn't always that obvious. And uh, we need to be aware that the church is still persecuted in the same way that we see Peter and John being persecuted here. And that's through the religious community. And that happens through false teaching, half-truth, watered-down gospel, you know, politically correct doctrine, uh, you know, and it's very, very subtle, but it's very effective because why? Because it weakens the church. It weakens the body of Christ. So if we could be more like Peter and John in our everyday lives and lay down our lives for Jesus' sake, not be concerned about what might happen or what someone might think of us, it would be a good thing. Now, we want to take a look at uh, verse 1, and I did do quite a bit of research on the Sadducees because I uh, really knew, I, I have known for a long time that they didn't believe in the resurrection, but I didn't know a whole lot more about them, and so I did some research, and I found out that the captain of the temple was actually kind of a, a policeman. Uh, and we also want to make note that, um, you know, if you read the Gospels, you see that the main opposition came from the Pharisees. Uh, and they, their, their name kind of dominates in the Gospels, but here in the book of Acts, we see the Sadducees are the opposition. Now, the Sadducees, they, uh, both groups were wealthy, um, but the Sadducees were filthy rich. I mean, they were extremely wealthy, and they liked to scrap, scratch Rome's back, and they really didn't care about the people. Um, they were a small group, uh, but they were very dominant in political influence. And religion was a social institution, nothing more. Uh, the Sadducees believed that only the written law was binding. None of the oral tradition that the Pharisees loved, they loved that. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't uh, care that much about that. Uh, so they also did believe the res there was no resurrection of the body, no future reward, and no future punishment. And they also believed that the spirit world was a myth, um, that man was a master of his own destiny, and there's no such thing as God's sovereignty. So basically, I don't even know what did they believe in, you know? Um, but in any case, it says that in verse 2 that they're greatly annoyed. And that word means that they were in a terrible, terrible mental anguish over what was going on here. Uh, you know, it was the kind of anguish that, that's based on indignation and wrath. And they were extremely, extremely uptight and angry. Verse 2 also tells us why they were furious. It says because they were teaching the people. You know, because they thought they alone had that right. Uh, you know, no one else had it. 
And here, these guys were doing it right in the middle of the temple area. They believed they had a corner on the truth, and no one else. Not, you know, they, they thought they were right, and no one else. Uh, the other reason they were so annoyed is because they were preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They were claiming that Jesus is alive. Now, you might want to stop and think about that. Uh, these men are, are claiming to be eyewitnesses, and that must have been kind of fearful for the Sadducees, because after all, they are the ones who uh, help crucify him. Then over in verse 13, we see another reason they were furious, and that's simply because they were uneducated and common. Uh, those words mean that they were ignorant of the rabbinic law. They, they haven't been to the right schools. Uh, they were just commoners. They're not professionals. They weren't priests. And so we want to make sure that we understand uh, why they were annoyed. Um, now, in verse 4, it says that uh, many, even, even be beyond this uh, persecution, many came to know Jesus as their Savior. And it says that, that uh, the men numbered 5,000. And that men doesn't mean mankind like you and I are part of the men that way. But it strictly does mean the gender. And so we know from that, that um, verse that many, many more, because ultimately the women and children weren't counted. So lots of people came to know Jesus under this persecution. Uh, we see that, that the, the fruit of that uh, healing of the lame man there, and even though uh, the persecution was, was right there in front of them, uh, people were getting saved. Uh, because they saw what, what God had done through the lame man. Now, persecution always brings growth in the church, and we want to we examine why. Uh, and the, the simple reason of it is, is when persecution comes upon the church, those who aren't really serious about their faith, they're going to fall away. They're going to just drop off like flies because uh, persecution is tough. Uh, and so what you have left are just those who are willing to, uh, to suffer for the name of Jesus. Okay, so in verse 5 it says, On the next day the rulers, the elders, and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Now, some of the names are familiar here. We, we know that... Um, uh, Annas and Caiaphas were involved in the business with Jesus there in his uh, trial. And we, but we do see a couple of names we're not familiar with, and that would be John and Alexander. And from what I read and studied on, it it's, seems like a, the, the high possibility are these are son of, some sons of Annas. So it doesn't really matter who they are, but, you know, I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, but... We, we do know here that um, this, these people, all these that are named, they made up the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin had 70 members, and then you would add the high priest. So there were at least 71 here. And we wanted, that's you know, quite a crowd that came upon uh, Peter and John. You've got to realize that this is a tough thing for the Sanhedrin to swallow because they're still, after all of this, they're still not rid of Jesus. Um, now, I want to point out one thing here, just so you can get it fixed in your mind in verse 7. It says that they had set them in, in their midst. And what I learned is that in, uh, the Sanhedrin uh, had a place where they usually assembled, and it was called the place of um, the Hall of Hewn Stone. So it was a place where they carved out a big room, and they would... Uh, all gather in one spot, like up here. They would put the, those on trial in the middle, and then the high priest would stand behind them. So the Sanhedrin would be looking at the, the accused and also at the high priest. And so it was in this room, in a, and they would gather in a semicircle and, you know, and go after it. So that kind of gives us a picture of what it was like. Now, think about it. This is so exciting because... Um, God has done something amazing when you, when you picture that scene. Uh, he has just given Peter and John 
an amazing opportunity to reach those in the Sanhedrin. And that's cool. Um, you know, sometimes those that oppose us think they have us backed into a corner. But there's always, under persecution, avenues are opened up that wouldn't ordinarily ever happen. And we need to see this, that that's not just true of Peter and John, but it's true of you as well. And you need to grab onto that, that, that any time there's any sort of persecution, there's an opportunity. God is giving you an opportunity. Um, we see, you know, if you look back in verse 3 of chapter 4, um, you know, when they were first arrested, did they fight back? Did they utter, you know, did they try to defend themselves? No. They didn't. They submitted to what God was about to do. They trusted that God knows what he's doing here. Um, and they, they didn't know what it was, but they submitted. And so he, God, in this verse, is showing us, I mean, he puts us right where he wants us to be, right in front of the Sanhedrin. And that's why we, too, need to be, be submissive. So isn't it really cool when we see in verse 7 that then when the Sanhedrin addresses the accused, they open up with just exactly the right question. Just exactly a lead-in, perfect lead-in for Peter. And they say, by what power? And what, he's, what they're saying is, by what, what magic are you using? They didn't believe in the power, remember? They don't believe in that. And so they're saying, what magic are you using to have made this man well? And then the second question is saying, by what, whose authority who gave you the authority uh, to do what you just did? Who, who gives you the authority to heal people and to teach the way you do? They asked that very simple question, and it was exactly what was needed to open the door for Peter to preach. But I want you to see that uh, Peter and John's submission uh, back in the beginning was key to everything. Okay, so in verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What powerful, powerful words. Um, here we see that, um, that they are filled with the Holy Spirit, um, and they begin to... Uh, uh, make their point that an injustice has been done here for doing a good deed, for, for uh, allowing God's spirit and power to heal this man. Uh, they are establishing that we've really done nothing wrong. Um, and, but remember, in saying these things, who they're talking to, uh, who Peter is addressing, because their, um, their uh, belief system, the Sanhedrin's belief system, is uh, you know, in total opposition to what Peter is saying. So the name of Jesus, no other name, and that's an unpopular thing uh, for them and for you and I, to say there is no other way to God except through the name of Jesus. Now, we've just seen here that um, uh, some ways that we need to respond to persecution is to be submissive and to be spirit-filled and to boldly use it as an opportunity uh, and to, um, uh, to be obedient. We're going to see that. Okay, in verse 13 it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, I want to just say, that is something that we need to, to focus on, and we, uh, Sue focused on it in our lesson material, is that, you know, can, can, I, can I be recognized as such, as someone who has been with Jesus? Does he, have his, does, does he have his mark on you? Can you, you know, are you shining that light? And we need to, we need to answer that question. 
Now, they had no respect. The Sanhedrin had no respect for these men because they were uneducated. They weren't priests and all of those things. But even worse, they were from Galilee. They were just, they were considered trash from Galilee. But the scripture says, but seeing the man, so we know that uh, the man is still, the healed man is still with them. It says, by, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So this is a tough problem for them, a uh, real tough problem. So it says, you know, that they're, they, they're, they're, they know that they still have Jesus in their midst. They haven't gotten rid of him. They couldn't argue that it had happened. They couldn't deny it, but they wouldn't accept it. And that is what we run up against sometimes. And maybe that describes you at one point in your life, where you couldn't argue with the facts. You couldn't deny the facts, but you had a hard time accepting it. But we need to recognize that that's the blindness of sin that does that. And that's what is going on here with the Sanhedrin. So it says that in verse 15, it says, when they had commanded them to leave the council, so in other words, they kicked him out of the hall of hewn stone for a while, and then it says they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So it says in verse 18, they, they called them, so they brought them back in, and they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They wanted to be rid of Jesus, you see. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So we want to see here that, you know, they've been bold. They've used this opportunity to share uh, Jesus Christ with anyone within hearing. And now uh, Peter is saying, no, we're going to be obedient no matter the cost. Now some of you might say, well, yeah, but doesn't the scripture also say in Romans 13 that we're supposed to, you know, submit to those in authority over us? Yes, it does but not when it's in conflict with the commands of God. And so that's, you know, Peter's reply is, is within the commands of God. And isn't it interesting, uh, as we reflect on the church universal, the church in general today, is that the early church had to be told to be quiet with their boldness. But the modern church has to be told to speak up because we're so intimidated by other people. We're so fearful of what the truth might, you know, the hardship that might come on us. And as a whole, that, that is true of the church. Um, it says that they brought them uh, back in and then they, they re reiterated they were going to be obedient. And then it says in verse 21, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people. See, there was a crowd of people out there, and they were all praising God for what had happened. And it says, you know, reminds us that this man was more than 40 years old. I mean, this was a big deal, like I said. And so it says, when they were released, they went to their friends. They were bound to those who were like-minded. They went uh, to receive report, to give a report, and to receive uh, encouragement from their friends. And uh, so they went to there, and it, you know, the, the thing that we want to see is that persecution draws the church together. It, it emboldens the church. It strengthens the church. And that's what we see here. It says in verse 24, when, when they heard all that the chief priests and elders, what the Sanhedrin had, had said, what they had done, it says that they all lifted their voices together to God. They, in other words, they blessed the Lord. They came back it, with uh, praise. And you know, they didn't have a laundry list of, of more requests from God. God was doing this work in their midst. And so they offered up this this. Uh, prayer of thanksgiving and, and praise. And then it says in verse 29 that 
as they're praying, they say, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. You see, they're asking God for boldness. Continue. Keep us faithful, Lord. And he says, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So it says, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So they continued to evangelize. They continued to minister to the crowd. And, they, you know, and that's the point, ladies, is that um, you know, when we ask God for power, he delivers. He delivers. Um, and, and then we see that you know, the, in verse 32, to the end of the chapter, we get a picture of what true unity looks like. We get to see the innocence of the early church because it says that the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And we already know that there are thousands already, don't we? And so we see that beauty right there of how they cared for one another and how they loved one another. But I also want to just remind you that, um, you know, those of us that have, have given birth, and you, you, you know, you, the first time you lay eyes on that, that baby, that first baby especially, um, because we all come into motherhood not really knowing what it is, you know. And so you've given birth, and you, you hold that precious little one, and you can't imagine you know, the sweetness of this little one. But it doesn't take you very long to see that they're just little sinners. <laughs> you know? Really. And, and we're going to see that next week, is that it doesn't take, you know, we see this beautiful picture, but it isn't going to take long before sin enters the church, before they're not of one accord. And so we need to think about that, not, not belabor the fact, but, but uh, continue with boldness with, what the, with the time and place that God has placed us in. We have, a, we have work to do, ladies. We have work to do. His work, not ours. His agenda, not ours. But we want to look at this and know how to handle persecution when it comes. And so I just want to reiterate, you want to be submissive. You want to ask God to be spirit-filled. You want to boldly take that uh, opportunity. You want to take it and use it. You want to be obedient to God no matter the cost, no matter the threats upon you. You want to bind yourself with other believers. You want to, you want to hang out with those who are like-minded. And that's what we all are here in this room, is like-minded, or we wouldn't be here. And, with, and, and during persecution, you want to continue to lift the name, the name that is above all names, and bless the Lord for what he's doing, what he's doing. Now, I want, to, um, I want to close with this. Um, probably, I don't know, 25 years ago when I had kids at home and, and uh, I was teaching them, and we used to have a, a big bulletin board in our, in our kitchen, and I had a great big huge map up there of the world. And I followed along. I was a, a member, I guess, of Voice of the Martyrs. I got their newsletter and their their magazine and stuff, and, and so we would look at that, and we would pray over some of those nations um, that God's word would, you know, flourish there, and the thing about it is when I started studying for this, I decided I wanted, I got on their website just to check it out, and I was astonished because, because I'm a save and Sammy, I went to my, um, my file cabinet, and I actually still have uh, a map with that on there. Uh, the map of the world and, and the different uh, colors indicate the severity of the persecution in that country. And so I got on Voice of the Martyrs and looked, and, and it's very sad because there are more countries that are being persecuted now, and those that were, you know, kind of a certain color are now red. And, uh, and that, it, that's troubling, but that also means that the church is flourishing. It's flourishing. It's going to grow. What, when it dies is when, when we're just on easy street here. And it might surprise you to know that I discovered uh, on the website there that, and I did check out a couple websites on persecution, but uh, uh, Iran is the fastest growing church on the planet. 
You know, isn't that cool? But they're being persecuted. And this is their message to us, and I printed it out. So I want to finish with this. It says, there are many American Christians who look at what's happening in our country. They look at the presidential elections. They look at the Supreme Court decisions, and they say, oh, no, the government is turning against Christianity. Christian principles are no longer being honored in Washington, D.C. What's going to happen to us? We can take a cue from our Iranian brothers and sisters in Christ. The people of Iran would say, hang on, serve the Lord, and see what he does. We're not dependent on the government. We're dependent on Christ. To be clear, persecution is not something to be sought after for the sake of persecution. Religious freedom is an ideal to be sought after and advocated for. But when persecution does enter our lives, we can respond as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 4:12. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. Therein lies our witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therein lies our opportunity to share our eternal hope with others who see us responding to hurt and shame in a way that doesn't make sense to the world. So let's not make sense to the world. Let's be different than the world. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, we worship you, Father, for who you are. We lift your name. Father, I pray that your spirit would move among us as we discuss this passage. Lord, we pray that you would help us to walk it out in our daily lives, that we not be fearful, but that we look boldly to you, Lord. Empower us, God, to be your people and to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.